Hello, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Happy to have you on this Monday afternoon. With us today is Dr. Costas Hajipinayas, who is a professor of neurosurgery and oncological sciences at the Icon School of Medicine, the chair of neurosurgery here at Union Square in Beth Israel, and the director of neurosurgical oncology for the system and the director of the Mount Sinai Brain Tumor Nanotechnology Laboratory. And I think we'll hear a lot about his work uh, there during his presentation today. He's also been a, a big friend to the Department of Medicine, and we are always deeply appreciative uh, for the opportunity to work with him. Uh, Dr. Hajit Panayas, I'll let okay. you invite. Thank you, Dr. Weissman. Let me just share my screen. Okay. And thank you, Dr. Berger, and thank you, Freddie. Uh, and thank you to the entire Department of uh, Medicine. So, um, you know, I think today we're going to talk a little bit about a journey I've taken for a few years with fluorescence guided surgery. And we've been fortunate to kind of be at the point of this journey. And it, it's, you know, it's something that we've learned from and, and been able to develop even further in the brain tumor world. Um, of course, I do have some disclosures I, I'd like to share. I do have a financial conflict with the Gliolan, which is the agent that's marketed for fluorescence guided surgery in the US. Uh, I don't receive any financial uh, compensation for any of sales at Mount Sinai in the Mount Sinai Health System. So here's a brief agenda of what we're going to discuss today. <clears throat> Much of my practice is really based on brain tumors and malignant brain tumors is my focus. So I'd like to talk uh, to the group about high grade gliomas. Uh, their extent of resection, and some of the unmet need that we face as surgeons. The concept of fluorescence-guided surgery is something we're going to introduce and, and go over, and I'll even il illustrate this with a few cases, uh, which will be helpful for the faculty and residents. Uh, and then some of the nuances to fluorescence-guided surgery with timing, use of some novel technologies, and then finish it up with a newer concept called photodynamic therapy, which has been around quite a long time, but now being reintroduced for the management of malignant brain tumors in combination with fluorescence guided surgery. So when you look at all the FDA approved drugs and devices that are available for high grade gliomas, it's really one slide remarkably. Uh, it's, it's a very short list of agents that have been approved through the years. And unfortunately, the list is short and the survival is still short with these types of tumors. And you know, high-grade gliomas are our most common malignant primary brain tumor in adults. Uh, of course, the most common primary secondary tumor are brain metastases. But you can see on the list here that temozolomide you know, is one of our standard of care drugs that we use and, and Avastin we use for recurrent glioblastoma, which is our most common high-grade glioma. And then there's these other types of uh, approaches with tumor treatment fields where patients actually have electrodes placed on their scalp, and then they have alternating electric fields used to treat their tumor, both at newly diagnosed in the newly diagnosed setting and at recurrence. And 5-ALA was uh, approved in 2017, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And Gamatel is a new intraoperative brachytherapy for malignant brain tumors that are recurrent. Here's the schematic of kind of what we follow in terms of high-grade glioma standard of care. So these uh, are usually operated on in, in almost all patients. And we usually try to achieve an, a safe maximal resection. Now, there are a small portion of patients we do biopsies on, needle biopsies that are stereotactically guided for tumors that are in difficult locations. Almost all the patients that undergo adjuvant treatments that include fractionated radiotherapy with concurrent and adjuvant temozolomide chemotherapy. And then you'll see here that this Optune tumor treatment fields has been introduced as a standard of care in newly diagnosed patients. And then at recurrence, we try to resect these tumors if possible again. Uh, and then they can also go on to chemotherapy with Avastin, re-irradiation, and of course, clinical trials. So that's kind of our standard of care for these difficult tumors. And in the surgical neurosurgical literature, we've really tried to address whether we can make a dent in survival. And this has been a controversial topic through the years, but 
really in the last two decades, we've, we've been able to show that if we maximally resect these tumors, we can actually change patient outcomes. And there's been, there have been a number of studies that have shown this where maximal extent of resection can uh, increase overall survival, progression-free survival, and even permit better efficacy of chemo radiation. Our current paradigm right now in neurosurgical oncology with these primary brain tumors, high-grade gliomas, most commonly glioblastoma, is really going after the contrast enhancing portion of the tumor. So if you look at the uh, MRI scan to the left, you could see there's a rim enhancing lesion. There's a necrotic core. And you, on, on the middle pane, you can see we, we resected that contrast enhancing lesion and there's some blood products there. This is what we try to do when we manage these types of patients. And that's called a maximal resection. But we know this is really not the answer. And, and it's kind of an antiquated paradigm based on some newer studies where if we take out the non-enhancing tumor portion in increasing increments, you can actually increase survival even better. And this was a study that came out of the UCSF and Mayo group in last year uh, where you know almost uh, 800 patients were looked at and resecting the non-contrast enhancing tumor really kind of elevated survival in these patients. And there's been other types of uh, studies that have confirmed this as well. The problem is, is how do we go after the tumor uh, when we can barely see the tumor and it's infiltrative? And this is where the biology of these tumors is really difficult. Uh, and they, these are why we call them intraxial tumors and infiltrative in biology. And as you can see on the lower left-hand side, that the tumor cells just spread from the contrast enhancing bulk of the tumor into the white matter tracts. And this is the dilemma that we face with these patients that make these so difficult to treat and cure surgically. So when we look at recurrences, almost always the recurrences occur within about a couple centimeters of the resection cavity because we just couldn't get to those cancer cells there. Now there are about 10% of recurrences that are distal and again, even if you look at those, uh, those are our connect, they are connected by the white matter pathways as well. So much of what I've focused on in my career is, is how can we see these cells better so that we can take them out? We know we can't take them all out, but we certainly can do a better job taking out the bulk of these cancer cells. This is a uh, image that I like to show and just, you know, really kind of showcases what we're talking about here. So this is an exascope which is a, a, a fancy camera system that I use that hangs out about my shoulder. Uh, I've moved away from using the traditional microscope, which I'll show later in this presentation. And this exoscope really gives us this gorgeous view to me. It may not be gorgeous to you, but it, it's, it's really an amazing view to me uh, where we can see kind of this tumor, it's discolored. And you, know, you can see that the margin of the tumor is, is quite apparent between this darkish Bray, uh, you know, brownish tissue and then the surrounding white matter. And then you can see these cancer cells without a doubt are here as well, but you can't see that. So how can I go after that confidently and resect that in our patients? Um, in the OR, we use a lot of fancy little gadgets and that's part of what makes my day go by really well and, and using some of these technologies and understanding kind of how to apply these technologies, which is actually the most important question to our patients in a safe manner. But we use almost a GPS system where we can kind of put a probe on the brain and kind of localize where we are. And we use MRI scans to register that ahead of time to allow us to use this GPS system. But it's really kind of flawed because we're using a preoperative MRI scan for this GPS system. As you can imagine, as you take a big brain tumor out, there's going to be some, you know, cavity there. The brain's going to sag a little bit. There's going to be shift, and all that GPS kind of becomes much more inaccurate. So that's where this concept of fluorescence guided surgery kind of comes in that I'm hoping we could discuss together today. So there's really an unmet need to, to visualize tumor in real time for surgery and help us delineate the tumor from the surrounding tissue. 
and then really resect what we feel confidently represents tumor. So that's something that, you know, I think we've now been able to come full circle with and you understand better with fluorescence guided surgery. So here's the concept. The concept is you administer a fluor or a pro drug in the case of 5-ALA to a patient that accumulates in the tumor tissue itself. And then what happens is you use a special wavelength of light to excite that fluorophore. So in this case, 5-ALA is excited by 410 nanometers. Now, when you excite a fluorophore, it gets excited to a different energy level that then emits light to go back to its resting state. And that emission light is what we're visualizing during surgery for fluorescence guided surgery. And in the case here, you could see that the tumor's lighting up violet red here. And this is something that was described decades ago in 1948. There was a, a, a surgeon by the name of Dr. Moore who described this in a single case report where he gave fluorescein to a patient. Fluorescein is an ophthalmologic approved fluorophore. And he, said, he found that it leaked into brain tumors. He didn't have any fancy microscopes. And fluorescein, uh, fortunately, is excited by the standard wavelength that we use with visible light. So he could see the fluorescence uh, leak into the tumor at that time in 1948. Well, it didn't, well, we weren't able to kind of re-look at this till in the 90s with 5-ALA, but the concept of fluorescence guided surgery is really rapidly grown in neurosurgery. And the reason for that is multiple. So first of all, now we have the ability to directly visualize the tumor in real time. And we don't worry about GPS systems once we get to the tumor with fluorescence guided surgery because we're seeing the fluorescence of the tumor and we don't worry about the shift. And it actually guides us in our resection of the tumor so we could take out more of the tumor in a safe manner. And that we believe can impact the over, overall survival of patients. Well, it so happens that in, the, um, in, the, in 2006, uh, in the early 2000s, Walter Stumer is a German neurosurgeon at the University of Munster. He led a multi-center study in Germany that was randomized to patients getting 5A lay fluorescence guided surgery versus conventional microsurgery. And these were high-grade glioma patients, WHO grade three anaplastic astrocytomas and glioblastoma tumors. And what he was able to show with his randomized study is that there was almost a doubling in the effect of resection of that contrast-enhancing uh, tumor that I showed you in, in the prior slide. And in terms of patient outcomes, he was able to show better progression-free survival at six months. So this really kind of heralded in fluorescence guided surgery, neurosurgery, because we have a randomized phase three study with randomized patients who undergo standard microsurgery with, a, with white light in the microscope, and then 5-ALA fluorescence guided surgery showing this dramatic effect uh, in this patient population. Now, the challenge with this study is it wasn't powered for overall survival, and some patients got chemo, some didn't, and it just wasn't a clean study in that aspect, but overall, it did show how, how impactful and meaningful fluorescence guided surgery was to the patient and to the surgeon. So now in this era in 2021, we actually have a couple different fluorophores that you know, we, we are able to use in the OR. However, there's only one that's FDA approved for the resection of gliomas and that's 5-ALA. As I mentioned to you, fluorescein is an off-label use agent that, that can accumulate in brain tumors through the blood-brain barrier that's disrupted, five, and that's at the 525 nanometer wavelength of visible light. And then the emission of 5-ALA is 635 nanometers, which is the violet red. And then there's ICG, which has been around as well, and that's a near-infrared agent that fluoresces at 805 nanometers, and that's invisible to the naked eye. So going back to our original um, uh, figure I showed you before, that patient of mine where on the left, you know, we've taken out the tumor, we think we're done, we switch on the blue light in a per person who's gotten 5-ALA, and you can see this violet red within the cavity. And the other intriguing aspect of 5-ALA is it does not fluoresce itself. It's actually its metabolite protopore for nine. So if you go back to your biochemistry days in med school, and the heme biosynthesis pathway, you could see that 
5-ALA is actually in our bodies right now and we're overloading the system. Uh, and it turns out that gliomas do not metabolize 5-ALA well after protopore for nine production. And there's a buildup within gliomas and that allows us to, to really delineate gliomas from the surrounding brain. So here's that same patient. I'm gonna show you a little bit of video. I hope it doesn't offend or cause any problems to our audience here. But you know, this is one of our early cases 10 years ago when I was at Emory, uh, we had the first IMB for 5-ALA glioland in the country. And this is one of our earliest patients we did in, in North America. And you know, you can see here, I'm gonna switch on that blue light that's at 400 nanometers and we're gonna excite that tumor tissue that's now accumulated protopore for nine, which has been metabolized from 5-ALA. And you can see here this, you know, violet red tissue. The, the video is a little bit antiquated. I, I apologize. I'll show you better video as we move through the presentation. But, but overall, I think it kind of shows, showcases what we're talking about in terms of the, the violet red fluorescence really correlating with the tumor. And then you could kind of flip back and, and just kind of see with white light, you know, it's just not as easy to differentiate that, that, that tumor tissue. So the, the profile and safety of 5-ALA is really, really impressive. And in, in fact, it's pretty much non-toxic. There is some skin photosensitivity because 5-ALA will go to the skin uh, and the bone marrow and it's metabolized by the liver. So there is some LFT bumps, uh, but they all go back to normal. But it does select, selectively accumulate in tumor cells. And that's really one of the strengths of this agent that we've been very fortuitous with. Uh, and that's been shown in a number of studies. And just going back to your biochemistry days, you could see here, you know, the heme biosynthesis pathway where 5-ALA comes in and then it's broken down into protopore for nine. And then protopore for nine is what's visualized with fluorescence. When you add iron to protopore for nine, there's an enzyme called ferrochelatase that forms heme. But in gliomas, ferrochelatase is less in, uh, present. So there's a backup pro protopore for nine there's actually less protopore for nine pumped out of the cancer cell with less ABCG2 transporter pumps. And then th there's increased uptake by this uh, PEPT1 uh, uptake um, mechanism. <clears throat> Some of the other questions that we've answered through the years are whether when we look at this fluorescent tissue in the brain, does that correlate with tumor? And, and the beauty of, of the studies that have been biopsy based is that there is an unprecedented high positive predictive value and sensitivity for delineating that fluorescent tissue as tumor. And these are some of the studies that have been done through the years where you, you have positive predictive values in the high 90s really correlating with fluorescence with tumor presence. Uh, the sensitivity is also equally high as well as specificity. The negative predictive value has been one of those that's been all over the place, and we'll talk about that shortly. But part of that is as you move away from the bulk of the tumor to the periphery, there's less and less fluorescence. So while there may not be fluorescence detected, there's actually cancer cells present. At Mount Sinai, we were the first to complete a, a multi-center U.S. study uh, in 2018-19, and we now have a paper in press now, it says under review, but it just got accepted last week, where we were able to, to look at 5-ALA administration in 14 centers in the US, and we were able to biopsy those fluorescent tissues and send them for pathology and really kind of confirm what others have done in a multi-center fashion in the US. And again, our, the sensitivity rate was in the high 90s for fluorescence and tumor presence and the positive predictor value was also uh, at 95%. So really kind of a, a great study uh, coming forth that, that highlights our experience in the US, years of work, uh, and we were, ha we're so happy to ha finally get this published. Going back to the concept I talked about with earlier, so if you look at the tumor bulk on the right, it really robustly fluoresces. But then as you move to the margin, that fluorescence becomes more pinkish in color. So we can actually know where we are, at, where we're at in the tumor microenvironment based on the fluorescence intensity we visualize. And then at some point we get to uh, an area where there's no fluorescence and it doesn't mean that there's no cancer cells there. It just means that with our current technology, we can't detect that fluorescence. And these are just some of the uh, 
histopathologic correlates to each of each of these microenvironments that we look at. Uh, the, the, the other thing that I wanted to also touch on briefly is that with the contrast enhancing border of MRI of the brain tumors, we can actually go past that with 5-ALA fluorescence. So that's th something that's been also studied and can help us understand how far we go past the contrast enhancing border, which gets back to my original slide where we're trying to alter this paradigm of just taking out the contrast enhancing portion of tumors. Patient safety, as I mentioned, has really been well established. The FDA had no issues with this when we went there to get approval. Uh, there have been no deaths with 5-ALA administration. There's been one overdose in a patient who had respiratory depression that, that transiently improved. Uh, and then again, just a transient bump in LFTs. The bigger question though is when we are able to see the tumor better and resect it better, are we hurting our patients in terms of neurologic function? And this is a study that was taken out of the randomized phase three study and really shows that at first there actually is more NIH stroke scale differences present within the 5LA fluorescence guided surgery group than the conventional white light group. But at three months, that basically all balances out. So I think, you know, while we're able to resect more tumor uh, in these patients, the neurologic function does uh, remain essentially the same as if we were going to do conventional microsurgery in terms of deficits uh, at a later time point. There are some reports of false positive fluorescence in these tumors. And, you know, typically that it's in the recurrent setting where these patients have had radiation and chemotherapy and, you know, the, the, the fluorescence is really in the vicinity of the cancer cells. It's just maybe scar tissue from those treatments that may be present. Uh, the false negative fluorescence is probably something we see more. And that's probably due to the fact that A, we can't see the fluorescence because it's covered by blood or other tissue. Uh, and then the other is timing. We may be waiting, we may be going to surgery too early before we give 5LA a chance to work well. The, we know the longer we wait, the better the fluorescence actually works and penetrates the brain tumor tissue. I'd like to highlight a couple examples here and you know, uh, we wanna have some time for some questions at the end, but this is a 50 year old patient who's right-handed who presented with progressive headaches and left-sided weakness. So as you can imagine, left-sided weakness, we think of something on the right side of the brain contralaterally, and you can see this peripherally enhancing intraaxial mass causing significant amount of vasogenic edema and cerebral compression. Uh, and you can see that it's kind of abutting the central sulcus. The central sulcus, you know, is on the left-hand side, you can see it here. So this is really a, a tumor that's, that can account for the patient's left-sided weakness. So the, the, the way we approach these patients are we administer the 5-ALA orally. It's an oral agent, they drink it. And I like to give it at least four hours before surgery and the dose is 20 milligrams per kilogram. And then, you know, we do all our standard stuff that we do in the oral with GPS registration. And then we also do some intraoperative uh, neurophysiology monitoring where we map out the motor pathways we use a device to stimulate the brain so we can identify those motor pathways and label them and avoid them during surgery. These are just some pearls. Uh, I don't know if we need to spend too much time here, but I think it's important that we wait you know, the proper amount of time so we can really um, see the fluorescence of the tissue. So this is that tumor at the surface where we're, we're gonna turn on the blue light and shortly you'll see that fluorescence kind of light up there and show us the tumor under the surface of the brain. So it's pretty obvious. Uh, while the, the video here may be less obvious to you, maybe because of lighting, you could certainly see that fluorescence there. And then as we move past you know, the, the main bulk of the tumor, that fluorescence kind of becomes pink. And then eventually we lose that fluorescence. And that tells us that we've done a, a good job taking out that margin well, although there's probably still cancer cells present uh, even uh, past that non-fluorescent non uh, area that we see with the microscope. And this is the post-operative MRI scan. This patient went on, uh, he had no motor deficits after surgery, his pathology was a glioblastoma. 
some of the other uh, vignettes that would be nice for the residents is that he had no MGMT methylation and the tumor was IDH1 wild type. So MGMT methylation is just a prognostic marker that helps us understand whether the patient will respond better or worse to radiation and chemotherapy. He did go on to standard of care treatment with chemo radiation. Uh, and believe it or not, he actually developed a contralateral left recurrence that I performed uh, four months after his first surgery. So this is one of those cases where he had a distant recurrence and, and we took him back and resected that and he's still alive to this day. Um, this is a, a recurrent glioblastoma case. You could see here, uh, patients already had radiation and chemotherapy, pretty large contrast enhancing tumor invading the brain. These can be some of our most difficult tumors we deal with. This is a little bit of a better video for you to appreciate the fluorescence that you can visualize with the protopore for nine after five ALA is metabolized. It's very obvious. So this is a, a tumor that fluoresced quite nicely. And you can see that fluorescence just lights up like a light bulb. And that allows me and my team to go in there, really kind of clean that up and take away that fluorescence if it's in a safe area. So I'm hoping you can see this well on your computer screens. And this is his MRI scan. So this guy actually did quite well after surgery. Here's some of those concepts we talk about too, just you know the, the, the color, right? We, we rely on some of the color to differentiate where we are in the tumor. And the pink tells us that we're kind of out of the bulk of the tumor. This is a patient that was probably one of our patients that didn't do as well that I like to show. Uh, she's a woman who had a recurrence after surgery, chemotherapy, and was on a clinical trial. And this is a tumor that abuts some of the motor pathways here. And it just really you know, diffuse, contrast-enhancing, large tumor, a lot of edema. And you can just see here, you know, there's a, there's a cystic part to this as well. Uh, and, you know, we went after this thing with fluorescence-guided surgery, and unfortunately, this lady got weaker after surgery. So, you know, that was my, I caused that. And, you know, obviously, we don't want to do that to our patients. We want to keep them in their neurologic function to make them better. Because if we take someone who's got a terminal condition and then make them weaker, then we know they're not going to do well in terms of performance and outcome. So this is one of those cases where, you know, being aggressive, you know, probably ended up hurting this patient. So it's not uncommon to leave behind some of that pink tissue if we know that it's encroaching on important pathways in the brain. So that's a concept that I teach neurosurgeons in our courses we have uh, every year, because the tendency is the neurosurgeon is going to want to go in and just take out everything that lights up. And we just can't do that. I mean, that's just not safe for our patients. So that's where judgment comes in. And unfortunately, this was not a good, good judgment on my end. While the MRI scan looked good, she had left hemiparesis. So I want to share with you some of the journey we took with 5-ALA and, and how we made it happen in the U.S. with FDA approval. 1998-98 was the first study that was completed in Germany where 5-ALA was administered to, to human GBM patients. And the randomized phase three study was completed in 2006, and that's when it was published in Lancet Oncology. That followed with European approval in 2007. We didn't get approval in the US for 10 more years. So it took us years and years and more years before the FDA finally agreed to help, uh, let us go forward with this. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the struggles we, we encountered there. We had the first IND in 2011 while I was at Emory. And, and then of course, in, in June of 2017 was the ap approval of 5-ALA for, for um, visualization of malignant tissue during glioma surgery. Part of our challenge was the FDA really equated 5-ALA as a therapeutic. So what we had to do is convince them that this is not a therapeutic, this is a tool. This is a tool that lets me and my colleagues see the tumor better. But the problem is the FDA didn't have a precedent to work with. And they like using other types of paths that they've established for their approval process. So this was a path that just had not been laid down at that time. And unfortunately, we got clumped with therapeutics. So anytime you talk about a therapeutic, they want you to do an overall survival study. Well, overall survival studies with a diagnostic imaging agent is really not that easy. There's all sorts of issues, especially in a surgical study with biases that you have to really think about and overcome. 
And we struggled with this for years. We struggled with this. Uh, and we finally had you know, a, a, a strategy that, that kind of helped us out. So that was when we got FDA orphan drug designation in 2013 for visualization of malignant tissue during surgery for malignant glioma. So we made no claims to outcomes. All we said is if you see fluorescence, you're seeing malignant tissue. So we wanted to come at it from a diagnostic standpoint, not a therapeutic standpoint. So that, that strategy did in fact work and we were able to take it back to the FDA and then also add some of the other data in terms of patient outcomes from the randomized phase three study, the diagnostic studies that I showed you earlier and the FDA took it and they said, okay, well, we like this, it's safe. It allows you to see the tumor, but just don't tell anyone that you could take the tumor out better and make the patient live longer. And we're like, that's fine. We don't, that's not what we want. We want to provide this for our patients and surgeons so that they could see the tumor and really resect it better. So this is a, us at the FDA in 2017. It's, it's been four years now. I can't believe it. But it was ju just a huge amount of effort, a number of people, pharma, academia. We had neurosurgeons from the country, from Europe. We had patients and their families there. We even had a company that had to get us ready to talk to the FDA for two weeks just on how to present to them. I mean, it was just a, a, a huge update. So anyways, fast forward now to, to you know, this past year and, and you know, it's approved, it's being used. Tons of neurosurgeons are using it around the country. Probably half of high-grade glioma surgery is using 5-ALA fluorescence guided surgery. So it really is really nice. It, it's great. And I really think we were helping our patients with this. And there's even some ICD-10 codes coming out for it. No CPT codes yet for us. Uh, and we're ex they're, the company's expanding into other cancers, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and then meningiomas, which are some of our mo most common benign tumors. There are still some challenges with you know, the use of technology and, and you know, neurosurgeons are, are pretty hard to change. <laughs> Once you get used to a certain way, it's gonna be very difficult to change the more conventional neurosurgeons, but you know, it's taking time and they're gonna they're going to see the benefits as, as things move on. And there are some capital purchases that we need as neurosurgeons to do this and we have to add it to our formulary. The cost is not cheap either, it's $2,500 per vial. So that's something that, you know, is definitely significant. So these are some of the, 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 the papers that we've seen just explode with fluorescence guided surgery. Uh, and now the slide's two years old. I need to update this, but you know we're now up to 500 papers, you know, just on this topic. You know, when we just had one paper in 1998. This is some. These are some of the tumors that it's approved for. You can see here just high-grade gliomas, including glioblastoma, anaplastic astros, oligos, ependymomas, and then even lymphomas light up with 5-ALA. So that's something that we're using for biopsies. Meningiomas, there's some clinical trials going on. We think that it'll be approved for that later. And then this concept of photodynamic therapy, which I'll share with you at the end here, uh, we'll talk about. Some of the other things that we like using 5-ALA are in some of the low-grade gliomas, which don't enhance. So when you guys see these, these MRI scans with non-enhancing tumors that are intraaxial, don't always assume those are uh, low-grade gliomas. Uh, in about 30% of them, they are actually high grades. And we've learned that because of 5-ALA, because we give 5-ALA to these people and they have little patchy areas of fluorescence during surgery, we sample that, those areas, and they're actually malignant. So the low-grade gliomas, we, we are almost always fooled uh, into thinking they're low-grade, but can be uh, malignant. And these are just some videos showing my colleague in Austria and Vienna using 5-ALA for a meningioma in the CP angle. Almost all meningiomas fluoresce, which is amazing because they're not malignant tumors. You know, that's something that needs to be studied. <clears throat> We're also about to kickstart a pediatric trial uh, at Mount Sinai. We're going to oversee this multi center study, which is going to be really promising because you can imagine extent of resection of pediatric brain tumor patients may actually have a much bigger and profound effect on outcome than in adults. So stay tuned for this story, because I think this is probably our most promising application uh, in our children. Other cancers, ovarian cancer, these are peritoneal mets where you can see fluorescence uh, detection of the metastases in the peritoneal cavity, pretty impressive. I mean, stay tuned for that. So ovarian cancer, breast cancer, 
And there's a head and neck study at Sinai that we're trying to kick off too with 5ALA. So just some, so a few moments on the timing. We're, we're learning that giving it and waiting longer actually works better. Some of the studies that were based on rodent studies were, you know, fluorescence was really, you know, at four hours and that's where the FDA label came from. But now we know that it peaks after six hours. And this is a paper we just published this year where if we wait after six hours, you can actually see quite robust fluorescence. And even 24 hours, this is a patient at Henry Ford who was part of our study, we could see fluorescence. This is what I use, we used to use, or I used to use before for my surgery. And now I've switched to the exoscope I told you about, which is hanging out by my shoulder and, and doing the work for me. I'm not looking through binoculars. This was a fellow of mine a couple of years ago. And you know, the exoscope allows us to have just a better view, better magnification. Um, and we're now using that with fluorescence guided surgery. Uh, and it's just kind of looking at a heads up display and doing your surgery is, is a whole new concept now. So that's something that we're also kind of pushing the envelope on. And this is a fluorescence guided surgery case. We're using all sorts of fancy tools in the OR. This is a headlamp I'm using. I just used about a month ago. And the headlamp shines this blue light and you can see the fluorescent tissue in the cavity there. So that's a fun device that we're using that's different than the microscope. We're overlaying fluorescence on, on images and with the microscope, this is called multispectral imaging. You know, for those biomedical engineers at heart, all this stuff is just so cool. It's fascinating and it's, it's really fun with what we do. And how we can see fluorescence better is, is a whole area developing now with handheld tools that we're using to kind of see that fluorescence better. And, and you know, that's something that we're actually part of as well. So, you know, we, we've done some handheld studies with spectroscopy devices to look at fluorescence and quantify it better. And our colleagues at UCSF and, and in Vienna have also done this with other lower grade tumors. We're looking at imaging combinations with fluorescence guided surgery in terms of whole brain spectroscopic MRI biomarkers where we can kind of push the envelope even further with imaging and fluorescence guided surgery. Uh, and this even includes PET imaging tracers where you can combine that with fluorescence guided surgery. Intraoperative MRI, we have in some centers where we have one at West and we're probably gonna get one at Mount Sinai Hospital where we actually do our surgery, put the patient in the scanner and then kind of see if there's any residual tumor left behind. Well, we can also combine that with fluorescence guided surgery and believe it or not, when we do a head-to-head -head comparison, FGS kind of stands up there with MRI by itself. Here's a study where we give two fluorophores to a patient, 5-alien fluorescein in the same patient. You can see we light up kind of the surrounding area with the, the, the green fluorescence, and then the tumor kind of lights up in a, in a yellowish-red fashion. So that's another area. So I'm going to end it here so we can have some time for some questions here. I want to talk about photodynamic therapy. I talked to you about fluorescence guided surgery, which is what 5 ALA is approved for in gliomas in this country. Uh, and you could see here on the top of the slide, we excite 5 ALA at 405 nanometers, and then it emits red fluorescence at 635. Well, it so happens that if you excite the protoporphyrin 9 from the 5 ALA and tumor cells at 635 with a laser light, you can actually kill cancer cells. And you could do that by creating reactive oxygen species that can lead to necrosis, apoptosis, all sorts of cascades. And, and that's the, the concept we're now moving to where we use 5-ALA to see the tumor, we resect it, and then we initiate PDT after resection to try to kill residual cancer cells in the cavity. So the, the University of Lille uh, group has kind of laid the foundation for this. They just completed their first phase one study in 10 high-grade glioma patients where they did surgery with 5-ALA fluorescence guided surgery. Then they put a balloon in the cavity during the same surgery, lit up the cavity with laser light. And you can see that here in this video. This is Dr. Nicholas Rain. He's a colleague of mine in France. And he's the, the guy next to him is the physicist who pushes the pedal and then lights up the laser light through the balloon and everyone's just kind of hanging out there for 30 minutes uh, as, the, as the PDT effect kicks in. Uh, so you can see that everybody's got goggles on. I'm going to show the video again. And you can see that laser lights on. The cavity's kind of getting blasted. And the beauty of this is that, remember, 5-ALA accumulates in the tumor cells. 
So it's pretty selective. So the PDT effect, which is just light, there's no heat, there's no radiation. It's really activating the protopore for nine in those cancer cells around the resection cavity. So you can see how attractive this could be for a therapeutic arm for our patients. So in summary, I think new intraoperative visualization technologies are essential for glioma surgery. 5-ALA is really the only FDA approved imaging agent for use in glioma surgery. And it provides real-time image guidance that delineates the tumor with high accuracy and is not affected by brain shift. Uh, new fluorescence devices may provide the surgeon with greater ability to resect tumors. And then this concept of PDT or photodynamic therapy is the next step forward that we believe in the management of these tumors. So I just want to acknowledge a number of people in my lab, uh, residents, uh, also other centers that were part of our multi-center study. And then of course our industry partners, you can't do this stuff without getting support from industry. So, you know, this is the kind of stuff that really helps us get things to the finish line. So I try to summarize a lot in, in these slides, uh, but hopefully I gave you a taste of, of kind of what fluorescence guided surgery means and the journey we took to kind of, to make it happen here in the US. It, it had its ups and downs, but I think in the end, we finally got it to the finish line. So, uh, you know, we're all happy about that. Wow, thanks for that. I mean, that was really, fascinating and not something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. So thank you. For, uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for raising that. We do have a, a fair amount of time for questions. So I'll let people uh, unmute themselves or enter them in the chat. And maybe um, just to be sort of really practical for a second, can you just remind yeah. us which sites across the system are doing this? And how do we how do we yeah. get people we think are appropriate referred into that? Yeah, great, great uh, question, Matt. So I, I think we're doing it at Mount Sinai Hospital. Uh, right now, part of it is because our microscopes are modified at, at, um, at Mount Sinai Hospital currently, and the, it's on formulary at Mount Sinai Hospital. So that's where we would be able to administer it to patients. Got it. And so we should refer people to you that we think are good candidates. Yes. And get them. Yes. You'll get them set up up there. Yep. Great. All right. What other questions are out there uh, on the floor? Maybe we can stop your screen sharing. Too. Yep. There we go. Yep. Any questions, a good question. Thank yeah. you because uh, uh, for such a great talk. Really uh, fascinating. Maybe you said it, I missed it, but if you could just go over again, I guess this is somewhat of a technical aspect, but for those yeah. of us who don't yeah. do this all the time, the, the hanging thing, like obviously not sitting at a microscope, you know, yeah. looking in the binoculars, working under this very constrained space. What are some of the um, imaging or other, uh, I guess, optic improvements that you get by using this shoulder-based camera and yeah. looking at a screen versus directly working in a microscope type of environment? Yeah, great question. I, that's a whole nother talk. <laughs> but I, so, you know, we've been able to kind of understand how to use that technology in terms of better magnification. There's a greater depth of field. So if you look at some of the work we use with the microscope, there's a very short depth of field. So we're continuously adjusting it to do our work. Whereas with the exascope, you kind of park it there and then you just got to, you know, you, you start doing what you need to do uh, because of that. And, and the, the light source is also a little bit different. So you use an LED source instead of a xenon lamp. So the LED source is, you don't need much light to see with it in comparison to a xenon light. So there's a, a bunch of big differences uh, in terms of magnification, lighting, clarity, depth of field. Uh, and then if you throw a robotic arm on top of that, then that, then you have you know this cool little concept that's controlled by the voice. So. Yeah, we'll have to share that experience later with another talk, but that's, you know, that's, that, that's what we uh, use every day now, and it's really fun. Sounds like a big step forward using better technology than a uh, 19th century, um, <laughs> you know, yeah. microscope. Yeah, and, you know, I don't want to bash the microscope companies because they are our colleagues, but y you get what you get with the microscope. It's an optics-based system, so you can only magnify so much. 
and you can enhance the image. And that's what some of the, the new digital microscopy uh, is, is all about, is that you could take that digital image, you could do whatever you want with it. You could change colors, you can enhance colors, decrease tones, you can overlay. And that's what makes it so exciting is that um, it's just a, a very, a very neat way to, to alter the image. Do our residents have any questions? Come on. We, we got a couple there. I know that it's going through their head. Often. Crickets. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. I, maybe you left everybody uh, speechless, but thank you. Yeah. Uh, Thank you for this. We look forward to, to seeing you again. Yeah, no, ha happy to help out. Just if you guys have any uh, questions or thoughts, please email me. And, uh, you know, again, I, I enjoy working with you all. And I think we want to develop things more. And, and we'll be talking about that as we progress at BI again. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Thanks so much, right. everybody. Have a good Thanks, day, everybody. Guys.